So this um, second presentation on, on methodology in business history is actually retrospectively now that I've heard Jeff very nicely complimentary to what Jeff has just said. Um, in this presentation, I will mostly look into the sort of nitty gritty detail of how you concretely extract evidence um, to do business history. The um, idea is that uh, business historians uh, are mostly looking into archives, as Jeff said. So in a way, you could also say that a number of business historians or a number of historians in general are also looking at oral history, which is another way of um, using that uh, evidence. Um, I'm not going to have a look at this because I think that the most widespread way of um, giving evidence in history is using archival sources, documents, written sources. So it's the, mass, the most valuable weapon in the historian's armory, but it's not, again, the only one. Um, when thinking about how to explain you how we use um, historical uh, archives in our research, um, I found three main um, ideas, the questions about the location of the archive, the evaluation of the archive, and the interpretation of the document you find. So location, I mean, where, where do you actually find the evidence? Um, evaluation, I mean, what, what does it, how, how do you think that this evidence could be the best or whether there could be another one that could be uh, more convincing? And finally, the interpretation, which is, I mean, basically how, what do you think the source is telling you? But before that, probably I need to say a word about what, what are archives. Uh, archives are basically records of the activities of plenty of different units, people, institutions. It can be uh, a record about the activity of a person, of a family, of a corporation, of a government, of an international institution, international organization, and so on. So in a way, each and every person or organization produces archives. Then the other question is whether they keep them, uh, but they do produce them. Importantly, archives can be private or they can be public. That happens very often with corporations for the private sector, and that happens mostly with institutions, international organizations, governments uh, for the public archives. I just gave here a couple of examples of what are private archives. The private archives of, for instance, the Lloyd Banking Group or the private archives of the Barclays uh, Group. Uh, both of them are open to the public. You just need to email them to ask access to their files. Of course, it's better if you can justify that you're a researcher and doing an academic study. In that sense, they will be more likely to grant you archives, access to the archives. Uh, but in theory, for instance, in the case of the public archives, you can just be a, a, an ordinary citizen and ask for access to the documents and you will be granted access to the documents, just out of the principle of transparency uh, of these uh, governments. Something that complicates this task of the historian is that conditions of access may vary from one archive to the other. Um, the first basic uh, condition of access that varies is the year of disclosure, the number of years that you need to wait for a document to be available. Um, if you go to the Netherlands, to, in the Dutch government, they practice a 20-year rule. If you go to France, most of the documents are now available after 25 years. Um, Britain used to have a 30-year rule and they're progressively moving to a 20-year rule. So you need to know these details of the functioning of each and every archive, which can be very tricky because um, I will give you in, in the course of the presentation a number of concrete examples, but here's one. Um, if you look at a box um, that has a chronological span of 10 or 12 years, it may be that the year that is closest will be the point of reference of the archivist. And as a consequence, the whole box, which could be open for the rest, will be closed. So technically, if you got, uh, say, um, to take an example, this simple 15-year uh, rule, in theory, you could see all documents date older than 2000. But if the box is covering documents from 2000 to 2010, then just because you got documents of 2010, you might, may not be able in the end to see the entire box. 
So that can depend on the archivist, on the roles in the archives. You can have an archivist that is very motivated and will take out all the documents from the box that you shouldn't be seeing and will just give you those that you could see. And some others won't have the time, won't have the willingness to do that. Ways to counter the problem of the um, disclosure is the Freedom of Information Act. Um, there is a Freedom of Information Act in Britain, there is one in the US that can be very useful to see documents either that shouldn't be disclosed or that are too recent to be disclosed. And grounds of, on grounds of the fact that you're a serious researcher, um, that your case is sensible, they can give you a freedom of information um, access. Sometimes you need to apply. That was the issue of being a researcher or just an ordinary citizen. Another element that is very important in the everyday life of an historian, uh, what sort of um, tools you can use. Can you use your computer? Can you photocopy um, documents? And can you use a digital camera? Um, in a number of archives, you can't use digital camera which is a big issue because, of course, if you have tens or hundreds of boxes to check, that's going to take a long, long time to see them one after the other instead of just going through the documents, taking pictures. Um, photocopying is a little bit the same issue. Going further in time with a more recent trend, some of the documents are now digitized. One aspect is the example I gave here of the European Central Bank, which is not exactly a digitization. It's more the first um, publication of the account of the monetary policy meeting of the European Central Bank that happened a few weeks ago now. Um, it's not very detailed, so they probably keep something somewhere else, or at least as an historian or potential historian of that period in a few years' time, in a few decades, I do hope they keep something else because that was a very short description of the uh, monetary policy meeting. But in any case, that's something that is freely available on the web. Other more important examples are those. The Committee of Governors, which uh, in a sense is the predecessor of the European Central Bank, um, is releasing year after year the accounts, the minutes, the agendas of the meeting that took place every month. So lately they released the um, the meetings, the minutes of the meetings of 1984. And you can freely download uh, the original versions of the documents in French and in German. Um, so you're also dependent on the language in which they were uh, created. Before moving to the location, um, another word on why and when do we use archives? Um, Jeff mentioned that in his presentation, we basically use archives as a proof of what we argue. Um, we could, again, use oral history as a proof, but as a general rule, historians tend to use more um, written documents as a proof um, to sustain what we, what we want, the points we want to make. Thinking about my own research, I identified sort of three times, if I may say, when you can need an archive. Uh, the first one, I guess, probably the easiest one, um, is once you identify a puzzle. You have a research puzzle and then you say, well, I would like to know more about this, so I will go to the archive to see what's going on. One example that is linked to my research, um, Bankhaus Herstadt, you may know the name of Herstadt, um, is a German bank that was relatively small in size um, that failed in 1974. Why does it matter, uh, this failure of a relatively small bank? Uh, because it was the starting point of a number of regulatory or supervisory efforts internationally in the sense that regulators and supervisors in Germany, of course, but also in Britain, in France, in Italy, in Europe, in, in the United States, realized that actually they coordinated until then very little, and they needed to meet in a forum internationally uh, to coordinate um, their positions. Why did Herstadt reveal this? Uh, well, because Herstadt was basically doing risky foreign exchange operations. Um, here a word 
uh, that Jeff used context. What is the context of the time? The breakdown of Bretton Woods and then the start of floating. So a number of foreign exchange dealers were trying to do deals to be the star of foreign exchange dealing and actually a few uh, were not very skilled in doing that and created many problems. That's how Herstadt failed in the end. And so the German supervisor um, notices the problems in the dealings and closes the bank on the 26th of June 1974. So far, so good. The problem is that the German supervisor closed the bank in the afternoon. What they're doing for an exchange dealing. So obviously that was the morning in New York. That was a big problem for the people who had started operations in New York in the morning. What did it highlight? What is known now as the Herstadt risk, namely the risk that you take in making operations across different time zones. So that's really the first example of this. But then looking into the literature, looking again in the historical account, in the details of what happened, there is no real um, account of what happened in the literature. Um, in the ac academic literature, uh, the example is very, very often mentioned as the starting point of international regulatory efforts. But you find little about the details of how the events unfolded. You do have a series, we were talking about the press, you do have a, a series uh, by the magazine Der Spiegel, uh, which sort of detailed in a journalistic fashion, not as detailed as it could be, uh, the unfolding of events but we don't know the context, so basically how the different actors were thinking about what happened at the time. Hence, that's from that observation that I decided, well, that's the time when I need archives, and I'll come back in a minute to what I found. The other way around, you go into f an archive, you see plenty of sources, and you then realize, well, I'm for once I do have the sources, then I, there is perhaps a puzzle behind this that I was not aware uh, in the literature. Uh, for those of you who were there a few months ago, um, that's linked to the story I was telling about the rise of Bahrain as an international financial center. I was ba basically looking into archives thinking about international regulation and supervision, the topic of before, looking at the archives of Barclays, of Lloyds, etc and looking into the boxes and regularly finding a box set uh, named Bahrain, Bahrain, Bahrain. And we're thinking, why, why do they have always each and every archive a box on Bahrain? There must be a story there. And so I went back to the origin, um, tried to find more details about it, and found that it was, again, little developed in the literature, and so that archives could be a good source uh, in trying to tell that story. A third option that you can guess is a bit of a mix of both. Um, and that was, at the origin, what I did when I started working on the creation of the European monetary system, so sort of the pure history of the uh, creation of the euro. Um, reading the literature, I tended to be dissatisfied with the classic narrative uh, according to which the EMS is something revolutionary that happens suddenly out of the blue, etc. I was dissatisfied, if I may say, in a rhetorical way, in a theoretical way, reading the um, analysis, the articles, the books. But I was also dissatisfied by the first explorations I had in the archives, thinking, well, the bits and pieces I saw in that box tend to contradict this story that is too easy. And then I was going to another archive thinking, well, Again, this document shows that actually the classic narrative doesn't work. And then I started doing the systematic look into the different archives. Now to the bulk of the, of the use of archival sources. How do you locate archival sources? It is sometimes straightforward. Um, if you're looking into the making of the Bundesbank monetary policy, you go to the Bundesbank archives. If you're looking for the position of Britain, British banks in the question of internationalization to Bahrain, you go to the archives of Barclays Group, of Lloyd's Group, of HABC Midlands, etc. 
It is often much less straightforward in the sense that the life of a document is very complex. Just think of a basic example of a letter, for instance, between two important people. Um, it is not a given that the letter will be kept in the archives of the first people or in the second people. You don't actually know where the document is likely to be. Um, it happened in the end that the story I was telling about the urban monetary system is mostly in how, it's, uh, how the events unfolded, mostly a Franco-German story. But actually all the documents, the most important documents I found about this story are located in the British archives. Why? Because the British civil service has a tradition of keeping very detailed records of each and every meeting to which British officials attend or take part. So in the end, I was able much, easy, much more easily to document what had happened in these meetings or in the preparation of these meetings or even in, in the sidelines of these meetings through the documents of the British archives rather than the French or the German ones. Then second step, if you identify the archival repository, um, where is the document likely to be located? Again, that could be very easy on the st in the start. Um, you can hope to have a catalog, then you look into the catalog or you look into the inventory and everything could go well. Problem is that there is not always a catalog. It is not always digitized. It is not always comprehensive, and it is not always up to date. Um, you may often find yourself, particularly if you look into more recent periods, into a part where the archivists haven't updated yet the inventory, particularly for the 70s, 80s, 90s, precisely because they're at that moment looking into the documents, organizing them, seeing what can be kept, what shouldn't be kept, what should be showed, what cannot be showed out of privacy, etc. So you may in the end, which I personally don't like, but I don't think my two historians colleagues will like that either, uh, you may rely exclusively on the archivist and just describe your research topic and the archivist will uh, do the research on your behalf because she or he is the only one to be able to see everything. Then of course the box that you identified uh, may not contain what is said in the description. You may hope to find the document you wanted, but actually the document either hasn't been kept or has been lost or has gone somewhere else. The other issue is that sometimes if you rely too exclusively on the description of the box, that may not work out. Um, you need a little bit of curiosity, especially if the box um, if you're looking for a document, say, on the year 1979, you got one box saying 7079, the other 1980, 1989, you might be well advised to go for the one that is mentioning the 1980s, because for whatever reason, the document may have fold, fallen into the box of the 1980s. So two, two concrete examples uh, coming back on the creation of the euro and the European monetary system. Here the sources for me were chiefly central banks, finance ministries, governments. But also importantly and showing the fact that archival research in a way relies a little bit on luck or chance. Um, the fact that there was two very rich private specific collections by Ottmar Eminger who used to be um, governor of the Bundesbank and who kept his papers and gave his papers to the Bundesbank. And his collection was very, very rich. Um, and Emile Noel, who used to be Secretary General of the European Commission for a very long period, and also who kept all of his documents, meaning a lot of notes, a lot of um, account of meetings, very detailed, and so on. And then on the more specific case of Herstadt, coming back to it, um, I think it's an interesting case about the problems of archival research because um, if you first identify that you want to work on Herstadt, you could think, well, first I need to go to see the archives of the company. Problem, the company failed, so I don't know where the documents are. Um, then, well, it's a question of regulation and supervision, so you should need to go to see the archives of the German regulator. Problem is that they're closed. They are held in the 
German uh, national archives, but they're not open. Then you can hope to go to the German finance ministry, but the problem is that the German finance ministry is not really playing a big role. And then, a little bit out of despair, I was thinking, well, I know already the Bundesbank, so I could just ask the Bundesbank, do you have documents about Erstadt? But the problem is that the Bundesbank played a very minor role, so the uh, supervisory and regulatory context in Germany is different than in Britain. Um, there is a regulator and a supervisor. Um, the Bundesbank in the story is mostly doing um, the, um, what happens after the, the bank has collapsed. It's not really supervising what the bank is doing. So it was more, mostly organizing the trials after the bank uh, had collapsed uh, with the different clients. Um, so I was not very hopeful um, that I would find something. And actually, out of the many boxes I saw, they had kept, luckily, uh, many documents uh, of their current spendants with the German regulator. A word about evaluation, very just a few, a few questions that we often ask ourselves. Of course, can we trust the document that we found? Um, is the document that we found comprehensive? Uh, what is missing? These were, for instance, very important questions I was asking myself, looking at the documents, talking about the German regulator in uh, the Bundesbank. What is the context? Very obviously, the author, the date. Um, again, and, uh, coming back to the example of Herstadt, uh, I was finding that sort of document, um, so it's in German, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's just a timeline of what happened um, at, at, the time of, uh, at the time when Herstadt started having problems. And they're describing a number of meetings that took place uh, between Herstadt and a number of people, either from the Bundesbank or uh, with the German regulator. So it's a list, very detailed, of the meetings. So of course it's a list, an official list, so in a sense you could instinctively trust it, but of course you need to question whether it's accurate, whether they didn't do mistakes, whether they don't uh, try to uh, tr paint or describe the story in a way that is more favorable to one institution than the other because it comes from one specific institution. And luckily here you can try to compare and contrast the different documents. Moving further into the methodology, that's where multi-archival or multi-country um, um, archival research is important. You look into different repositories. So here I could contrast a little bit with the documents I had found in the German finance ministry, but also with documents, for instance, from the Bank of England. A quick word on the interpretation, because I guess we can mention these issues in the Q&As later on. Um, interpretation is, is much closer to any sort of analysis beyond the use of archive. You try to understand the extent to which the document is helping you in giving evidence to the point you want to make. Um, importantly, you try to see what you know and what you still don't know. What exactly can this document help you to conclude? And also how the, widest, how the reconstruction you're doing is fitting within the previous explanations or the theories that are uh, on this. Coming back to the two examples I was mentioning, interestingly, the Herstadt story is, in, terms, in theoretical terms, uh, showing that the classic dichotomy between regulatory capture and financial repression, so a company can capture regulation for its own good or financial repression, the government is imposing too much uh, regulation, is of relatively little use in the case of Herstadt. There is no, um, there is not someone from Herstadt that tries to control regulation. Uh, there is no issue of a regulator trying to impose too many regulations. It's just really a problem of who failed and who made mistakes at one point, how they perceived that the situation would go on. And in the case of the EMS and, and the creation of the euro, here we move perhaps beyond international business to other theories um, that I guess are also useful in international business but are more uh, related to political science, namely constructivism, so the role of ideas. Um, the role of governments, 
and the role of supranational institutions and the sort of spillover effect. Looking into the detail of how the events unfolded, very often these theories are helpful to see the perhaps wider explanation, more ambitious explanation, but when you go into the details, it doesn't really hold. So it shows the limits, it helps to show the limits of the different theories. To conclude, that's actually something Jeff mentioned before. So the, the archives basically help us to reconstruct the process of how the event unfolded. And more importantly, I guess, um, the classic questions of, of an historian, why what happened ha happened as it did and not as it could have done. You try to think about the different paths that have not been taken. And the importance of archives for us is that they help to do so in a way that other type of evidence will not be able to do. Typically, thinking back about Herstadt, uh, the press coverage was good, but was not enough. Uh, I think he won Herstadt, who was owning the bank, has died. But I'm not sure he would have been a good person to interview, because obviously he was very disappointed that his bank failed. The same for the foreign exchange dealer in question that was responsible for the mistakes. He was certainly not suddenly ready to agree that he made mistakes. Um, and even, even if he was, that wouldn't have been the definite proof um, to show the problems. And then to qualify the different theoretical contributions. Probably to conclude um, uh, on the last note, um, historians are often said that, it's often said that historians are a bit reluctant to generalize and to theorize. And while doing this presentation really focused on archival sources, I was actually wondering whether it's not because we tend to be completely into the sources, then writing up that we very reluctant to theorize, because in the end, these sources tend to show us the details and how it's difficult to generalize. In other words, if we want to theorize something, then immediately, because of the precision of the sources, we tend to find and to have in mind very quickly the one exception that will say that the theory doesn't work. So it's probably a drawback. I don't know if it's one of the, um, one of the problems in the cooperation between historians and other disciplines, but I thought that was um, a note on which I could end. Thank you very much.